Okay. So uh, now we can start. So we were talking about the symmetric group. Oops. We had uh, introduced the cycle uh, cycles in the symmetric group. So this was just to have uh, an element, uh, say, A1 to AR, where this uh, is just a set of elements of a set of numbers from 1 to n, such that uh, sigma of AI will be equal to AI plus 1, and uh, if I is smaller, smaller than R, and it's equal to A1 uh, for uh, I equal to R. So that really means they are, the permutation uh, permutes these elements uh, cyclically. And obviously, sigma of n is equal to n if uh, uh, of k is equal to k if uh, k is not an element in the cycle. We had then seen that every element in Sn has a cycle decomposition. So we had this uh, theorem. Every sigma in Sn is the product So sigma is equal to sigma 1 times times sigma s of disjoint cycles. So um, disjoint cycle just means that the supports are disjoint, so the sets of elements which are actually permuted by them. And uh, we also had seen that this... Uh, a product is essentially unique, um, and it's called the cycle decomposition of sigma. And uh, <coughs> we want to see that um, <coughs> the so if we have a uh, we want to now use this to describe the conjugacy classes of S n. So um, the claim is that uh, what we want to show is that there's a 1-1 one -one correspondence between the conjugacy classes of elements in Sn. So a conjugacy class is just... Uh, uh, an equivalence class under uh, the operation of being conjugated, so where A is equivalent to, to G, A, G to the minus 1, or A and G in this case in Sn. So we want to have one, one correspondence between the conjugacy class in Sn and uh, the partitions of the number N. So I have to remind you what the partition is. So definition. Um, the partition of the number n is a is a tuple. See n. 1 to, say, an R of positive integers so that means that uh, Ni is 
bigger than zero, uh, which are somehow ordered. So with uh, n1 is bigger or equal to n2, bigger or equal and so on, bigger or equal to nr, and the sum of the ni is equal to n. So, for instance, the partitions of 4 are, uh, you have 4, 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay. You can easily see that these are all. So, in this case, there are 5 different partitions of 4. And now we want to associate to every conjugacy class of elements in Sn the partition and want to see that this is a 1, 1 correspondence. So let uh, so maybe I call this definition. So let sigma in Sn be a permutation, and um, let uh, sigma equal to sigma 1 times times sigma r be its cycle decomposition. So the cycle decomposition really means that these are that sigma is the product of these disjoint cycles, and that the union of the supports is the is the whole of the set one n. So every integer from one to n occurs in one of these cycles. Some of some of these cycles might be one cycles, which uh, then means they are themselves the identity, but that's okay. So <coughs> so we can look at the so let L of sigma i be the length of the cycle sigma i. So that means sigma i is a L of sigma i cycle. No? So for instance, this thing would be an R cycle. The length of this thing is R. So by obviously this composition is well defined up to reordering them because it's the, the sigma i commute. So we can by by reordering we can assume that uh, the length of sigma one is bigger or equal to that of sigma two, and so on. No, we can just. Uh, decide in which order we want to enumerate them. And then the tuple say uh, L of sigma 1, L of sigma 2, and so on. L of sigma R is called uh, the cycle type of sigma. Now I claim that this thing is a partition of the number n. So so clearly these numbers L of sigma i are positive integers because they are the length of a cycle, of the cycle. So it's some positive number. So the L of sigma i are positive integers. And we have ordered them in such a way that uh, they are descending in this way. And so, and we have also clearly that L of sigma 1 is bigger or equal to 
L of sigma r by our definition. So the only thing we have to see is that the sum of them is n. But uh, um, <coughs> so, but we have that sigma is equal to sigma one times sigma r is a product of disjoint cycles. So every integer from one to n occurs only in one of them, and the support. The union of the supports of the sigma i is uh, the set 1n. This is what we wanted for a cycle decomposition. So that means that if we take all the numbers, so every number from 1 to n occurs precisely once among all the numbers occurring in the cycles. So that means, and the, the length of the cycle is the of, of a cycle is how many numbers occur in it. So every number from 1 to n occurs precisely in one cycle. Uh, so <coughs> the sum of the lengths of the cycle is the total number of numbers that occur in all the cycles. So this number is n. So thus the sum i equals 1 to r, L of sigma i is equal to n. So this is a partition of n. Okay, and now we want to see, um, so we can look at uh, maybe some example to be sure we understand what we're doing here. So if we, for instance, take the, again, the element sigma to be uh, the element in S6, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then, what is it here? 6, 2, 5, 3, 4, 1. Um, so then we can make the cycle decomposition. So 1 goes to 6, and, and 6 goes to 1, and um, 2 goes to 2. And 3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 4, and 4 goes to 3. So this is the cycle decomposition. So the lengths of the cycle are 3, 2, and 1. So the cycle type is is this partition 3 to 1 of the number 6. So now we want to see what the cycle type has to do with the conjugacy class. So uh, the claim is that two partitions are conjugated to each other if and only if they have the same cycle type. Lemma. Two permutations. sigma and tau in Sn uh, are conjugated uh, if and only if sigma and tau have the same type of cycle type. Okay, <clears throat> so we want to see that. So we have to see what does it mean to be. So we take uh, our element sigma. Uh, B uh, element is B is so this is the cycle decomposition of sigma. So now we want to take an element conjugated to it and see that it has the same cycle type. So let, uh, maybe I call this thing pi. 
uh, let um, tau be an element in Sn. And so we want to take to conjugate uh, sigma with tau to see um, what happens to the cycle type. So if we form tau sigma tau to the minus one, it's the conjugated element. What does it do? So we want to Know, to find out what this is. Um, <coughs> so, so we have this cycle decomposition. So we write uh, sigma i equal to so a i a one i until a say m of m of i i okay. So I think you know it has a double index, no? Because the, so the the ith cycle goes from a1 to a m i, but the, it depends on on this. <coughs> um, and then we put so for all i from one to r and j from one to m of i. Uh, we put B i B uh, no, that was maybe uh, B J i to be tau of A G i. Okay, and we put uh, say pi equal to b one i until a b m of i i. So we take a so we make a new uh, new cycles by replacing. The AIs, the AIJs by the BIJs. And now, <coughs> what do we have? So if we take tau sigma, tau, so tau C sigma tau to the minus one, and we apply this to some, to some element BIJ, what is it? First, we apply tau to the minus 1 to this. The tau to the minus 1 of this is Aij, you know, because tau of Ai of uh, here it is, yeah, so it was the other way around, but anyway, Ji. So the tau of Aij of, of Aji is Bji. So the tau to the minus one of bji is a j i. So this is tau of sigma of a i j a j i. Now we apply. We know what sigma does to this because sigma is the product of these disjoint cycles sigma i. So applied to this element, it's just sigma i applied to this, which sends this one to the next one in the same cycle. So this is tau of, uh, so there are basically two possibilities. This is tau of um, a j plus 1 i, if uh, i is smaller than m i, and it is, um, it is the first one, so a Uh, one i if if j is equal to m i. No, that's how it is. So you just have the cycle. You turn it around. You know, you go one further. This one to the next, and so on. And the last one comes back. Uh, and this tau applied to this. 
But now tau of this is the corresponding thing with b. So this is uh, b. E, j plus 1 comma i if j is smaller than m i and it's b 1 i if j is equal to m i. So that means this thing permutes just the b i j's, the b j i's in the same way as here the a i j, a j i's are permuted. So it follows that tau sigma tau to the minus 1 is equal so, uh, say, pi 1 times pi r, where pi i is equal to precisely this thing. Maybe I write it on the next line. where, as I already wrote here, pi i is equal to b1 i until b m i comma i. So, so we see that what happens is actually very simple. If you have a, a cycle and you um, conjugate it with a certain element, then what happens is just that you know you get again a cycle of the same length where the elements in the cycle are replaced by the images under the element by which you conjugate. So in particular, we see that these have the same length as before. And uh, so and clearly we have that uh, the cycle type. of uh, uh, pi equal to pi 1 to pi r is equal to that of sigma. So we see that if two permutations are conjugated, they have the same cycle type. And now for the converse, it's actually not very much. You can basically retrace the steps. So assume we basically just have to see that all the steps can be reversed. So assume that sigma and pi have the same type of type. So we can write sigma equal to sigma 1 to times times sigma r, pi equal to pi 1 times pi r, where the length of the sigma i is equal to the length of the pi i for all i. So that means I can write so. I can write sigma i equal to, say, a1 i until a, say, m i i. And uh, um, pi i, I can write as b1 i until b m i i for uh, for you know just some elements a e one i uh, <coughs> so for for this just some elements in one n
Okay, and the same here. So as these have the same number of elements, <coughs> and the union of all these, I mean the union of the supports of them is after all the set 1n, we can find the bijection from 1n to itself by just sending h, each aji to the same, to the corresponding bji. So let uh, tau from 1n to 1n. So I send a j i where you know, you know in this decomposition to the corresponding b j i. We know that these are disjoint subsets of one n and their union is the whole of one n. So this is a bijection of it to of one of the set one n to itself. And by what we have proven here, we know precisely <coughs> So, so by the above, we know if we take tau sigma tau to the minus one, then this is equal to pi. Because we have precisely seen that this is, you know, we are precisely back in this situation. And we know that if we uh, conjugate in this way, we get that the cycle with the AJIs is replaced by the corresponding cycle with the BJIs. So, <clears throat> okay, so this, um, it's anyway good to know that uh, this conjugation has this very simple effect on, on the cycles. So, so um, as a corollary, we now can uh, count the conjugacy classes of Sn. So the number of conjugacy classes of Sn is equal to the number of partitions of n. <coughs> and you know basically we have shown it proof so <coughs> we have seen that the map have seen uh, that the map which associates to a partition, to a, <coughs> so the map from the conjugacy classes in Sn to the partitions of the number n, which associate to a conjugacy class of an element sigma the cycle type of sigma so we have seen that <coughs> uh, so what have we seen we have seen that if that the uh, cycle type of a partition depends only on the conjugacy class so that means this map is well defined as a map from conjugacy classes to partitions. And we have seen that, in fact, two elements are conjugated to each other, so in the same conjugacy class, if and only if the partition is the same. So that means this map is well-defined and in injective. So we have to see it's subjective. And that is very simple. We just have 
for every partition, we have to write down a, uh, an element in the symmetric group which has that cycle type. But well, that's kind of trivial. No, we just have to. So, for instance, so let's say if, if uh, P equal to N1 to NR is a partition. Only that only P is a partition of N, then we can take sigma. So we just have to have something where the lengths of the cycle are given by this. So we take, so it means the sum of the Ni is equal to N, and we just take, so say, 1 until N1 as a first cycle, then we take n1 plus 1 until uh, n1 plus n2. So the length of this will be n2. And you can kind of see how it goes on. In the end, we have n1 plus, plus nr minus 1 plus 1 until the sum of all the ni, which is equal to n. So this is a kind of a cycle decomposition of some permutation, because these are just disjoint cycles times. Um, <coughs> and uh, we see that the length of the corresponding cycles is here n1, here n2, and so on. Finally, here it's nr. So this has cycle type. OK, so we have this um, uh, projection. And we, OK, so this was as much as I wanted to say about this cycle type and the uh, conjugacy classes in SN. Now finally, to finish with the symmetric group, I want to talk about the sign of a permutation. So this um, is something that you might be uh, even familiar with from um, uh, from linear algebra, sometimes you one of the definitions of the determinant is that you take the product over all ways how you can take one element out of every row and column uh, and you multiply by the sign of the permutation and you sum them all up. So it already occurs there. Now I want to introduce it here. So so there's one so an invariant. Uh, so a number you can associate uh, to a partition of a partition is its sign. And uh, in fact, you know, so the kind of the way how one usually understand it, understands it is it is uh, minus 1 to the m, where m is equal to the number of uh, transpositions uh, which one uses in you know so the partition is commonly called sigma uh, used to write sigma so if I write sigma as a product of transpositions there will be many different ways how to do it but the claim is that the whenever you write it the number of transpositions you need is either even or odd. And this does not depend on how you write it. And minus 1 to the number of transpositions you need is uh, the sign of the partition. Now, <coughs> so this is what it is. For some reason, <coughs> it's not now the easiest to work with for me at this moment. So I give another definition, and then I show it's equal to this one. 
Because obviously here the problem is that whether this definition is well defined or not. Or you could expect that sometimes you need an even number, sometimes an odd number. But this is not the case. So definition, I give a much more complicated definition, uh, which is a bit crazy somehow. So let uh, n bigger equal to 2 be some positive integer. And uh, so, so, for, so for sigma in Sn, the sign of sigma is, uh, so it's called, uh, denoted by epsilon of sigma. And I write down some crazy formula. So this is the sum over all i bigger than j. I say moment, sigma of i minus sigma of j divided by i minus j. So these are all integers. So you can certainly do this. And the sum means it's uh, the sum is over all pairs of integers i comma j with um, i and j just integers from 1 to n and i bigger than j. Okay, so I take this sum. So if, if you look at it in a, the first moment you look at it, you might even wonder whether, you know, whether this is a sign. This is supposed to be plus or minus 1. So in the first moment, you might even not be sure whether this is plus or minus 1. You know, it looks like a rational number. But we'll see in a moment this is not the case. So <coughs> now let's study it. So the first claim is that epsilon of sigma is equal to minus 1 to the m, where m is not precisely this, but something similar, where with um, m equal to the number of pairs, let me write it, equal to the number of pairs j with, um, so again, ij are pairs in 1n, no? With um, i bigger than j and sigma of i smaller than sigma of j. So this is the number of elements where kind of the order of the elements is reversed by the permutation. This, what? Ah, well, you're right. This is this would not make any. Um, yeah, yeah. This would not make any. I think I, yeah, I certainly want the product. Yeah. What? What? Okay. Let me see. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. If I sum, I get zero. Yeah. But uh, so if I, the product is okay, this this term will never be zero because i is different from j, and this is a, a permutation, so they always are different. So it, this was just a, a misprint, which, however, I <laughs> I did not. Uh, okay, this is certainly the product. I think uh, now in the proof, it also is everywhere the product. So, and then the second statement is that this epsilon. So the map which associates to uh, permutation its sign is actually a group homomorphism. So secondly, the map sigma, no, epsilon, from Sn to the set uh, consisting of the elements 1 and minus 1 together with a product. So, you know, this is a subgroup of the uh, whatever 
the rational numbers with multiplication. So 1 times 1 is 1, minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, and 1 times minus 1 is, is uh, minus 1. So this map is a group homomorphism. So w where these are really the integers 1 and minus 1 with the multiplication. Is this a subjective or non-subjective? Well, it's obviously subjective, yeah. But I mean, that's uh, uh, if n is at least 2. But I mean, that's kind of uh, trivial. We'll see that in a. But uh, um, so it just means, you know, if you have a, for instance, if you just have a trans, you know, according to this uh, story, if you just replace two things, if you t replace one and minus, if, if you have two elements, uh, say, you always have uh, the transposition one, two, and this transposition will have, uh, according to the part one, the sign minus one, and obviously the identity, according to the same story, has always the sign plus one. So it's uh, trivially uh, subjective. So this is a group homomorphism. And third is that uh, the statement that I used as a definition. So if uh, sigma equal to tau one, times tau k is uh, a decomposition as a product of uh, transpositions with uh, tau i transpositions. Then it follows that uh, epsilon of sigma is equal to minus 1 to the k, So, which was what I first uh, set uh, would be the uh, the definition. Okay, so let's prove it. So we have to deal with this idiotic uh, uh, formula. <coughs> so let's see. Let's just write down as before, product i bigger than 0, sigma of i minus sigma of j. So we are afterwards supposed to divide it by this. So uh, we want to compare it with this. So let's look at what this is. Well, clearly, I can write this as a product of all i bigger than j where uh, sigma i is also bigger than sigma of j of the same thing. Times the product where now sigma i is smaller than sigma of j, sigma i minus sigma j. Oh, that's not very. Uh, difficult. <coughs> but now, <coughs> you know, you could, um, if you exchange the role, if you here take the product the other way around, you get each time a sign minus one. So this is um, equal, if I want product i bigger than j, sigma i bigger than. Um, OK. So anyway, so I can replace this by sigma j minus sigma i. And I get the sign minus. So I, if I do this here, I get minus 1 to the number of elements here. So I should maybe say that m was the number of pairs. So I claim this is minus 1 to the m times the product over all sigma i bigger than sigma j of uh, sigma i minus sigma j. Because what do we have? So this is the product over all um, <coughs> no. Uh, 
Yeah. So what I mean is that if um, you know, so we get this. <coughs> I think this is. Sorry, I think I'm a bit confused. Yeah. So if um, I is bigger, so here we have this. In the second product, we can exchange the role of I and J. No? If we exchange the role of I and J, then we get now that um, uh, J is bigger than, than I is smaller than J. Sigma I becomes bigger than sigma of J. And <coughs> now we have exp exchanged I and J, so we get the sign minus. And so we get minus 1, and we do this precisely m times, where m is the number of time of, ele of elements which occur here. m is the number of trans is uh, equal to the number of pairs of ij, where i is bigger than j, and sigma of i is smaller than sigma of j. So these are precisely those which occur in the second product. They are precisely m factors. Is it clear, or should I start again saying it? When you make some kind of, uh, you look slightly unhappy. <laughs> Should I explain it again? Or is it clear? What? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. I hope it's fine for everybody. <coughs> anyway, so we have this. So this will be this. And now, <coughs> so now what do we have here? OK, maybe I write a little bit more. I write back what I had before. Uh, sigma of i minus sigma of j. So, so note that, so first I should notice that these are precisely m factors. No? Because m was precisely the number of pairs ij such that i is bigger than j and sigma of i is smaller than sigma of j. These are precisely those which are here. And now, in this last product, we want to exchange i and j. So. So I with J. So what does it mean? It means now that first we get that now I is smaller than J. And sigma of I is bigger than sigma of J. So just the last factor looks like this. And here we have sigma of I minus sigma of J. So which precisely changes sign. So we still should write sigma of i minus sigma of j, which is the same as minus, um, so, so, because now this i, so we have, we have exchanged the role of i and j. So now what was i before is now j and vice versa. So i is smaller than j and we have this. Okay. So, <coughs> so we have precisely m factors. So this part is minus 1 to the m times product i smaller j, sigma of i bigger sigma of j, uh, sigma of i minus sigma of j. But now, if we put this together, here we have the product. So I've only dealt with the second factor. So this is the product of the i smaller than j, sigma of i bigger sigma j, than j. And here we have the same product with i smaller than j, but the sigma i's are the same. 
So the condition is now only on the sigma i. So if I now, this was a computation in between, but if we go on here, this is equal to a product over all ij such that sigma of i is bigger than sigma of j. Uh, sigma of i minus sigma of j. So this is this product means it's the the product over all pairs i j such that sigma of i is bigger than sigma of j. You know because there's no condition on whether i is bigger than j or smaller because we have used both. But now sigma is a permutation of the set one n. So here. <coughs> Uh, if we apply, if we apply i by sigma of i, we have just reordered the factors. So this is the same. So reordering the same as a product over all uh, i bigger than j, i minus j. No, because I just replace sigma of i by i. If I do this for all i, I get the same factors only in a different order. And so this means if I take the quotient, uh, except that obviously I made one mistake, because I had this factor minus 1 to the m here, which I dropped. And so the the definition was that I'm supposed to take this product and divide it by the product of the i minus j. And what remains is just minus 1 to the m. OK, maybe you can go through it again also. But OK, so this is 1, then 2. Um, so I want to see it's a group homomorphism. So it's somehow always the same trick. So which takes some time getting used to, so maybe you can recognize it the second time. So we want to show it's a group homomorphism. So if I take a product of two uh, permutations, then I should get also the product of these signs. So for if I take sigma and tau elements in a symmetric group, then we have uh, the product <coughs> So we want to compare, you know, compare um, epsilon of which one do I want to tau? Sigma tau. We, we want to compare this to epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau. In fact, we want to show they are equal. So let's try to try to compute this. So according to this definition we have given. This is uh, the product over all i bigger than j. Sigma of tau of i minus sigma of tau of j divided by i minus j. OK, there's nothing wrong with that. So this is just the definition. Now we can certainly multiply this as one often do in analysis, multiply this with 1 in a slightly complicated way. Um, <coughs> ah, so I hope you remember the statement. Uh, so we just multiply this with 1. So this is a um, product i bigger than j, uh, sigma of tau of i minus sigma of tau of j divided by i minus by so it was by i minus j instead we multiply it by tau of i minus tau of j and we multiply by tau of i minus tau of j divided by i minus j if i want i can also write product i bigger than j so we have this no, this is just, we have just multiplied. We have multiplied by this, and we have divided by the same. So there's nothing happening. Uh, 
And now let's look at this factor. So So I claim, first I write it down and then I give a reason, this is the same as a product over all tau of i bigger tau of j. So it, this means again the product over all pairs ij of uh, different elements in 1n such that tau of i is bigger than tau of j of sigma of tau of i minus sigma of tau of j divided by tau of i minus tau of j. Why is that? So if i is smaller than j and tau of i, if i is, is bigger than j and tau of i is bigger than tau of j, then this is this, you know, nothing changes. If i is bigger than j and tau of i is smaller than tau of j, we can replace, uh, you know, we can exchange the order of i and j. So we replace i by j, so then i is smaller than j, tau of i, so, so that means, so if, so in this, to compare these two, so if i is bigger than j, tau of i and tau of i is bigger than tau of j, we just take the, the effector here, is, you know, get the same factor here. No change, don't change anything. We don't change the factor. And uh, if i is bigger than j and tau of i is smaller than tau of j, we replace uh, so i by j and j by i. Then we have now that i is smaller than j, uh, so then the new i is smaller than the new j, and the uh, tau of i will now again be bigger than tau of j. But what is the effect of this? Replace i by j. So then, so now this, the denominator changes sign because we, replace, we exchange these two. And the numerator exchanges sign because we replace because we flip these two. So then both numerator and denominator change sign. Okay, so we, we get all we get this whole product, we get this product from this product by exchanging i and j in all the factors where this holds. And when we do it, in each, each time we exchange them, both the numerator and the denominator change sign, so the whole thing doesn't change sign, and so they're equal. And then we have the same argument as we had to finish the argument here. If we take the product over all pairs with tau of i bigger than tau of j. Tau is a, a bijection from the set 1n to itself. So <coughs> we can apply this bijection. Uh, so it means that if we replace tau of i by i, we have just permuted the factors. So tau is a bijection, so for each value tau of i, we get, uh, you know, for each tau of i, tau of j, we get a factor. And if we replace tau of i by i for all i, we get also a factor, and we get the same factors because tau is just a, uh, tau is just a permutation of 1n. So there's a bijection between the factors in the same way as we did it here. So it means this is equal to the set of all i bigger than j, sigma of i minus sigma of j divided by i minus j. So <coughs> let me say it once more again. I just say that these 
factors here are just the permutation of these factors. They are permuted by the permutation tau. And then, obviously, these two things together say that uh, this product, so this together says that uh, epsilon of sigma tau is equal to epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau. Because here, this is epsilon of tau. And this one, we find, find is epsilon of sigma. So this is part two. And then the third one is, uh, the third statement was that, uh, uh, was this one. So if we write sigma as a product of transpositions, then epsilon of sigma is minus one to the number of transpositions we use. And for this, we only have to see that for transposition, uh, the, this number is one. So uh, is minus one. So for three, to prove three, uh, it is enough to show that epsilon of tau is equal to minus one for any transposition. Because, uh, you know, as this is a, S by two, uh, this epsilon is a homomorphism. So if I uh, take uh, yeah, epsilon of sigma, this is epsilon of sigma one times epsilon, epsilon of tau one times epsilon of tau k. Each time we get minus one, so we get minus one to the k. Okay, and so we just see it. So for instance, if tau is equal to 1, 2, so the transposition which exchanges 1 and 2, then we just see, uh, then obviously, um, epsilon of tau is equal to minus 1. Because there's uh, precisely, you know, if you look at this thing, then all stay the same. So if i bigger than j, then also tau of i is bigger to tau of j for all i except for 1 and 2. And 1 and 2 are exchanged. So we get one factor minus 1, and all the other factors are 1. So, no. So 2, 1 is the only pair of i, j with um, um, i bigger than j and tau of i smaller than tau of j. And so this gives us minus 1. And so now, on the other hand, we know <coughs> uh, by the above that if you have a transposition, so now if, um, if um, now tau is equal to ij is a transposition, We know it's conjugated to this one. In fact, if we uh, take, um, if, uh, if sigma is a permutation um, in 1n with uh, sigma of 1 is equal to i and sigma of 2 is equal to to j, then we know, we have seen this, that if I take, uh, which way out it goes, tau 1, 2, tau to the minus 1, then this is equal to ij. So if we apply, again, our epsilon to it, this is a group homomorphism. So it follows that epsilon of, uh, say, this permutation ij, so epsilon tau 
epsilon of 1, 2, epsilon of tau to the minus 1 is equal to epsilon of ij. OK, want, uh, so this is some number, plus or minus 1. Um, this is minus 1. So it's minus 1 times epsilon of tau times epsilon of tau to the minus 1, which is epsilon of tau to the minus 1. So, you know, now we are just in the group of uh, 1 minus 1 with multiplication, so this is commutative, so we can cancel these two and we get just minus 1. So we see that for uh, any transposition we get minus 1 and this proves the result. So, <coughs> Finally, one can use this to introduce the alternating group. So, definition, a permutation, sigma in Sn is called even if its sign is 1. So it means it can be written by an even number of, uh, of transpositions. So the um, set of even permutations um, is called uh, the alternating group in n letters and denoted en. And note that this is a normal subgroup of Sn. An is a normal subgroup. No, because it's the kernel of a group homomorphism. You know, it's uh, An is equal to the kernel of the map epsilon from Sn to 1 set 1 minus 1 with the multiplication. So the kernel are those which map to um, the neutral element. OK. So um, one of the things which, um, uh, so this group occurs sometimes. One of the things it occurs in is also in Galois theory, I don't know whether we will mention that later, but um, <coughs> uh, the fact whether you can solve the polynomial equation by taking roots and so on, it depends on whether a certain group is solvable, which is, has something to do with having enough normal subgroups. And it turns out that uh, the fact that you cannot solve all polynomials of degree five in terms of uh, taking roots, nth roots of something, is connected to the fact that this group An is simple. That means has no normal subgroups. But we will see. That's actually not so. Is for n equal five. So it's a, you know, it's a, just a statement that uh, you know we. Uh, for instance, A5 is a simple group. I was um, thinking of making that an exercise, but it's somewhat difficult, and so maybe I don't. <coughs> so we have actually found the problem. What? We have actually found the problem in SL that causes SL not to be commutative. What? 
research in SM that causes SM not to be communicated with even communications. I still don't understand you. So what is not commutative? Because if you push it out of SM with even permutations, you get something that is uh, isomorphic to a commutative. Um, well, I would have to think about the statement. So you you say that ah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, well. You you could say like that. Yes, if you want. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. It's they are certainly in principle. Well, I don't know precisely what that means now. So, because if you, for instance, take um, um, the fact is, you know, if you take S three, for instance, as the simplest example, so the obviously the, the even permutations are actually a cyclic group, so they are also commutative. The fact is only that the S three is actually to isomorphic to the dihedral group in three letters, so it is somehow. It comes from two cyclic groups, but altogether it's not commutative. So it's um, so I don't know what how this answers your your question, but you, you can see somehow the, the way how the two come together is somehow. Uh, I mean, sometimes. <coughs> so in this case, you see that the even permutations are actually commutative, and the quotient is also commutative, but the whole thing isn't. Okay. Okay. So I took a bit longer than I. Expect so. Now we will want to start um, to prepare for, in some sense, for the uh, statement and proof of the seal of theorems, and we do this by studying operations of uh, groups on subsets. So if uh, let me see operations. On subsets. So if we have a, so see if if G acts on a set X on a set S, it will also act on the set of all subsets of S. Set. We want to a little bit investigate this because we will use it when we try to prove the seal of theorems. And anyway, it's interesting to know. So let's uh, state this. So let G act on a set X. And uh, let U be a subset of S, then for an element G in G, we can form GU to be the set of all G, maybe I write with time because of an operation, G times U. So this is not, U doesn't have to be in G, it's not automatically a coset. G times U, the set of all G times U, where U is an element in U. Okay, so we have, um, we can associate, we can make an element G in G act on a subset of S by just taking this set we obtain by applying G to every element of U. So it's easy to see. Um, that the map G comma U maps to G times U defines an operation of uh, G on the set of subsets of X of S. Of G on 
a set of subsets. Okay. Of course, you know what you have to see. If you take the identity, it maps every u to itself. If you take the identity element in G, it maps every one to itself. And if you take the product of two elements, it's the same as if you apply first one element and then the other. It's kind of trivial. We can also see we, we can restrict this action uh, to subsets of S with a fixed number of elements. No, so we can, so I claim we have an, if we just take the set of subsets of S which have five elements, then this operation defines an operation of, on that set. And this is because, as, as we have learned, the set, the multiplication, the operation is always by bijection. G times from S to S, which sends uh, an element S to G times S, is a bijection. It follows from the fact that you have an operation that each element operates by a bijection. And so if uh, you fix, uh, if you have an, a subset with a given number of elements, applying G to it, it will have the same number of, the image will have the same number of elements. And now we want to define the usual things that we have for operations. So if we can look at the stabilizer. GU. So if U is a subset of S, no? The stabilizer GU is um, the usual thing. It's the set GU. Uh, which is the set of all G and G, which, uh, you know, which have, th with respect to this operation, act as the identity. But what does it mean? It means such that G times U is equal to U. No, that's the stabilizer. So it means that the set U is mapped to itself. So, the as usual, this is a subgroup of U. And maybe there might be some, what? Yeah, well, it couldn't, could hardly be one of U. <coughs> okay. So, I just, uh, as a warning, uh, the stabilizer GU of U in this thing is not the set of uh, all elements G and G which fix all elements of U. So it is not, so G U is not the set of all G in G such that G U is equal to U for all U in U, which would be the stabilizer of every element. It just stabilizes the set. So each element of the set is sent to some element of the set. But rather, the set of all G in G, such as GU times U, is an element of U for all U in U. Is that a problem? No. Okay. But anyway, it's maybe obvious, but I just wanted to indicate. Well, okay. I s I make some one trivial proposition. Small remark. So let G act on a set S. Uh, 
and uh, let u in S be a subset. Then I'm, I'm ask myself when the stabilizer of u is the whole of g. So then g is equal to g u if and only if u is a union of g orbits. OK. So we can see that's quite obviously. <clears throat> and that's basically obvious if you think of what it means. Um, <clears throat> so g, by definition, g is equal to gu if and only if g times u is an element of u for all u and u. That's essentially the definition. And for all g and g. So, <clears throat> so the set of all g u's, g times u's, for all g and g is the orbit of u. So that means this is the same as the set of all that GU is contained in U for all U and U. And the statement that for each element its orbit is contained in U is the same as saying that U, so for every element its orbit is contained in U, is the same as saying that U is the union of orbits. namely precisely the g of u for elements u and u. Um, OK, maybe, I mean, it's not a good moment to start something new now, so maybe I, I will stop. Maybe I, well, it's OK, maybe I stop now. <laughs>